I'm with Josh Lent from Imtertsu. Now, uh, Josh, what is Imtertsu? So Imtertsu is an organization. Imtertsu, first of all, means if you want. If, uh, the famous line from Theodor Herzl, which is if you will it, if you dream it, it could happen. And we started in 2006 as an organization. And we started on college campuses. It started four guys in a living room after the Second Lebanon War. And those people that came back to their college campus, they were they came after the war in Lebanon, and all of a sudden were exposed to all these anti-Israel opinions on college campuses within Israel, and that encouraged them to start Imtertsu. And Imtertsu is the largest grassroots Zionist organization right now in Israel. We have over 6,000 volunteers. We're active on every college campus. We have post-academic branches. And we're involved from every single matter in terms of raising awareness to the public, educating the youth, passing laws in the Knesset. We're really across the board. Is there a lot of anti-Israel rhetoric in the universities in Israel? Um, yes. We would be surprised how many professors we've exposed that are pro the BDS movement or just recently in Tel Aviv University, because it also is, comes from the students themselves, just recently in Tel Aviv University, there was a protest in honor of the martyrs, and there was calls for intifadas. And this is also not an isolated incident. This also happened in April, right before the terrorist attack that was on Dizengoff on Tel Aviv, where two people were killed in a bar, in a restaurant. Two hours before that event, there was also calls for intifada, not far from this, in Tel Aviv University. And this happens in several universities across Israel, whether it's Ben Gurion University, whether it's Hebrew, incidents like this are not isolated. And this is why we've led, just recently, we've led a discussion in the Knesset that is to stop politicization in academia. And we also led this previous year, we've led an entire discussion to discuss terror incitement that Israeli students have to face on a daily basis. So is this Arab students that are saying this, or is it Israeli students getting involved with BTS as well? It's predominantly from the Arab students, but the teachers are across the board. The teachers are belong to the extreme left side of the map, a good portion of them. And it's led to a fear of students who have a different opinion to express their views. You see it right now with what's going on in Israel that anybody who has a view that doesn't meet the status quo, they kind of have to hide it. Just uh, recently in all the university, they've been encouraging people to go out to the protests on the street using university resources. Mm. So just recently, we did a giant campaign on this matter, and Hebrew U announced yesterday that they will not use the educational platform to encourage students to protest, that they will keep the educational platform Moodle apolitical which was a big win for the organization because in, in academia, someone's political opinion shouldn't be forced upon you. And tell us a bit about some of the projects that you do. So we have several projects in Imtir Tzu. Part of the projects that we do is really just educating the youth. We have an uh, initiative called Zionism on the Bar, which is we bring the top Zionist speakers throughout Israel to local bars to reach the students where they're at. And... We speak about Zionism, we educate the youth, we do tree planting all over the country, we treat soldiers where we go out to all different areas across the country, give stuff to our soldiers. We have a different initiative, which is called Filming the Filmers. Throughout Israel, soldiers at the checkpoints face tens of people every day that will stick a camera in their face, harass them, hope to get a 10-second clip that they could spread, use their propaganda across the world. So we have an initiative called Filming the Filmers, which is we film them back, and we release the entire story. We expose these people for who they are in Israel. And part of exposing them, it also puts a face to what they're doing, and a lot of them have actually not come back to the field afterwards. We also deal with laws in the Knesset. We have 13 laws in the works at the moment. We have the largest social media out of any largest Facebook page, out of any of the Hebrew-speaking Zionist NGOs in Israel, which we really raise an awareness on what's going on within this country, because there's a lot of stuff that the media won't necessarily report on, and it's important that someone shines a light on kind of what's going on within this country. Is there a lot of demonization of Israel in the country and also out of the country? So 
what we believe as an organization is a lot of the demonization of Israel that's going on within the country is a primary cause of the demonization that's going on in Israel outside of the country. And this is, we've been, we released a book on it recently called The State for Sale, which exposes that over a billion shekel in the past 10 years has been funneled from foreign governments to the most radical left anti-Israel organizations within Israel. And these could be anywhere from organizations that support terrorists in court. These could be anywhere from organizations that spread lies about Israeli soldiers all across the world. And what these governments are seeking to do is change Israeli policy from within. Not in a democratic way, not by sending delegates. What they are doing is they're using money to kind of get beat, cut the line of democracy. And it's something that we've been exposing, and we have laws in the Knesset to curb the funding from these foreign governments. We have three laws in the Knesset at the moment that are supposed to stop this, or at least minimize it. One of the laws is that if uh, there's a country that Israel has no peace relations with, whether that is Saudi Arabia, Qatar, that, and they're funding a nonprofit within Israel, the odds are is if they're funding a nonprofit within Israel, they're not doing it with good intentions in terms of solving the conflict because they're not Israeli peace partners. So it would ban those donations. Another cause is that if over 50% of your donations come from foreign governments, there will be a tax on that because really you can't really call yourself an NGO, a non-governmental organization, if all your money is coming from foreign governments. Mm. And it's also to go after the, the nonprofit status of these organizations that are predominantly foreignly funded. Is it important to work with the young people and give them a defense for the nation of Israel? Of course. What we primarily try to do is really focus on the youth. We're most active on college campuses. We have youth groups because the youth are the future in this country. And if anybody wants to get to the point where they have a chance of defending Israel, they need the facts. And that's really why we do all these initiatives. We release booklets. We go to schools, pre-army academies, and we really try to spread the message and po kind of open the kids' eyes a bit. Because mm -hmm. especially at the, when they're youth, they're sponges, and they're willing to listen to information. Do you expose the Palestinian lie, and what sort of things are they saying? So we definitely expose the Palestinian lie. We actually, in Israel, there's something called Nakba Day, or in general, there's something called Nakba Day which the Palestinians use to symbolize the Nakba, which happened in 1948. They view it as the catastrophe. And we have something in Israel where they're at the, all the universities. They have protests or a day of memorial in honor of Nakba Day. And we have something that's called Nakba Nonsense, where we do we definitely expose it as a lie. Because if you actually look at the facts... This was a war of annihilation that the Arabs launched in the area. There was no such thing as Palestinians at the time. This was a war of annihilation three years after the Holocaust where they sought to kill 600,000 Jews and they lost. And you would never see in a different culture. I mean, we don't do a Nakba day for all the German soldiers, for all the Nazis who died in the World War II. If you launched a war of annihilation... Again, also, if you even go into the facts of the war, they said it was going to be a war of annihilation. They said to people to leave their house, come back in two weeks, because the Jewish people are going to be finished by that time. And again, if you look at the Palestinian refugee lie, because this is one of the biggest lies that there is, you look at an organization such as UNRWA, which is supposed to be the Palestinian refugee organization. First of all, if you look at it, that's nothing more than anti-Semitism. There are several refugee crises across the world. There's only one organization by the UN that specializes in a specific refugee crisis. That's UNRWA, which has a budget of over a billion dollars. The other nation's refugee organization has, over the years, been able to solve, not solve, but they've been able to resettle many refugees. UNRWA hasn't resettled a single one. And if you actually look at what is a refugee, in UNRWA, it's a very funny little definition. In UNRWA, anybody who was 
in Israel from the two year span with 1946 to 1948. So it could be considered a refugee. So that means an Iraqi merchant that came in to do a little bit of business, he could be considered a refugee. But also, if he died, he's still considered a refugee. All his kids, grandkids, great grandkids, they're all considered refugees. So it is the biggest, it's the most growing refugee crisis in the world. But it's also because of these funny definitions. And the other definition of refugee, not the Palestinian refugee, there's ways you could lose your refugee status. So, for instance, if you're a terrorist, you lose your refugee status. If you achieve wealth to an extreme degree, you could also lose your refugee status. You currently have people in Hamas who have a net worth of a couple hundred million dollars, some as much as a billion dollars. They're considered refugees. If you get citizenship in a different country, which should be the end of a refugee crisis, you're still considered a Palestinian refugee. So when I say it's a lie, I mean it's the only refugee crisis where really the world doesn't seem to want to end. And the reality is there was Jewish refugees, wasn't there? Of course, if you look at the area, the Jews had their own version of the Nakba, and these weren't the aggressors. These were Jews living in... Morocco, Iraq, all throughout the Middle East, 900,000 Jews. No one speaks about those refugees. There's no talks about reparations. There's no talks. All the, basically, what you had was, in a sense, an exchange of populations. You had 900,000 Jews who were kicked out of their lands. You had people that were living in Israel who were told to leave by people that were seeking to kill off the rest of the 600,000 Jews that were living in Israel. And that is the cause of the refugee crisis. Because the Arab nations at the time didn't take responsibility for the people that lost the war, that is what is causing the refugee crisis today. Is your right to a Jewish state based on the Bible? Part of it is based on the Bible. If you look at Judea and Samaria, if you look at that the Jews are an indigenous people to the land of Israel, I've always talked about Israel. It's, It's mentioned in the Bible. It's not mentioned in the Quran. But if you actually look at it, I don't even like to enter the biblical argument Because a biblical argument, how do I explain Israel's right to exist to an atheist? Mm. If you look at it throughout international law, you you look at the San Remo Conference, you look at Balfour, Israel has the right to exist from a legal perspective also. We're actually advancing a law right now with uh, Canadians for Israel's Legal Rights, a non-profit in Canada, where it's going to recognize Yom San Remo, the day that memorializes the San Remo Conference, which happened in 1922. And this is really because it's important, it's critical that Israelis, Jews across the world, and really everywhere across the world, because this seems to be the most hot-button topic at everywhere you look, know that Israel's legal rights to exist. You work with bereaved families of terror. Tell us a bit about that. Yes. So we worked with the Bereaved Family, the Blue Family Forum, which is essentially a forum of bereaved families across Israel. And they're seeking to kind of protect the bereaved families because a lot of the bereaved families, they don't see full justice for what's going on. In Israel, there's a policy that is supposed to be after you commit a terrorist attack as a deterrent because the PLO has a pay for slave policy. So if you kill a Jew, you will be receiving a salary better than what you'll be receiving if you don't kill a Jew. Mm. So the Israel has a policy where they destroy the family's house. You know it's the price of business, all right? You want to kill a Jew, your house is getting destroyed. And these families, they don't see this happening. They see it happening, either delayed, they see petition after petition after petition to the Supreme Court. And that's mainly coming from foreign governments. But outside of just helping them on the legal side and escorting them to courts, what we also do is we do many projects through our tree planting or through our giving stuff out to soldiers. Most recently, we worked with the Fogel family who were the victims of a horrible, horrible terrorist attack in 12 years ago in Itamar. Five people were killed. This past Sunday, we planted trees with the family in memory of the 12th year. Two weeks ago, we went with Dr. Adva Bidon that started the organization Adele in memory of her daughter who was killed by a rock-throwing attack when she was... She got injured when she was two. She died from the injuries at age four. We went out to give treats to soldiers with Dr. Adva. And a big part of it is kind of not forgetting about the bereaved families, not forgetting about the people 
who their family gave their life for this country. Yom HaZikaron, we go all throughout the country to bereave families, because again, these are the people that without their family's sacrifices, Israel wouldn't be what it is today. What are you doing to help fight BDS? The biggest thing that I could say that we're doing to fight BDS is BDS, a big part of it, operates and derives from what is going on within Israel. We actually you view BDS, what's going on in the international criminal courts in America, as kind of a symptom of the disease of the BDS that's taking place within Israel. If you look at it, the BDS that's taking place within Israel, you have organizations that are going all across Israeli organizations that are growing across the world and slandering Israel. And it gives justification for the BDS. They always like to say, we have with us this Israeli who, even this, look, even the Israelis agree with BDS. Mm. Whether that is professors, whether that is so-called human rights groups, just if you actually look online, you could see that Breaking the Silence, which is a group that 80% of what they said have has either been proven to be false, completely exaggerated, or not been able to be verified at all when they expose what is so-called war crimes by soldiers or so-called incidents within the field. And they were taking part in a conference with Roger Waters, who is one of the biggest anti-Semites that you could think of. And if these organizations sought to keep, really focus on what's going on within Israel and work with the Israeli government, work with the Israeli public, then I wouldn't have as much of a problem. But the fact that they're going out to speaking to the biggest anti-Semites that they could, to, that is, I view as a very central cause of BDS. And we are fighting that as hard as we can through legislation, through spreading information to the Israeli public. And that is what, what our group's biggest contribution is to fighting the BDS movement. Does BDS actually damage the Palestinians as well? I'm thinking of SodaStream. Of course. My sister actually works for SodaStream. And yeah, if you people don't understand that Israel, contrary to the belief of some people around the world, Israel is not an apartheid. It is a place where Arabs could work in. They could work across the field. You have Arabs in the Supreme Court. You have Arabs in the Knesset. You have Arabs really across in every position that you could think of. And if you're going to say BDS, 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 and then Israel is going to have to move their factories, let's say from Judea and Samaria, that's going to harm the Arabs who are working in those areas in Judea and Samaria. So you, you actually have Palestinians working on farms in Judea and Samaria. And if you say, oh, I'm not going to buy any food from Judea and Samaria, then you're actually damaging are, the farmers. Yeah, the farmers are going to, then going to say, or the farmers or the factories, well, I'm, it's not worth employing anybody within Judea and Samaria. We'll move the factory to an area around the country. We'll move it to an area that isn't under dispute. And the, all those people will lose their jobs. Is Zionism very strong today around the world? I definitely think that there is hope for Zionism. A big This past year, Nefesh Benefesh had, I think, 95,000 people that made Aliyah, which was their biggest year in a long time. A big part of what's going on with Zionism, why people are moving to Israel, is unfortunately a lot of it due to anti-Semitism that they're facing across the world, whether that's in France, whether that's what's happening in Ukraine, whether that's what's happening really across Europe. So Zionism, but that's really what it is. It's about being the safe refuge for the Jewish people, the only one in the world. Is this a huge battle that you face? I think w the biggest battle we face is kind of the propaganda efforts that are really going against the Israeli public. And what I mean is we fight the NGOs, we fight the academia, we fight really all these people that are trying to force the opinion of a minority within Israel on the public and they do not have the public support in this and what we really try to do is we try to fight these initiatives whether this is in academia whether this is in by fighting these radical NGOs this is what our contribution is and we try to fight really the anti-Israel causes within Israel and hopefully that has a trickle-down effect to what's going on across the world. What is your hope for the future? My hope for the, the future is that there will be peace, there will be a strong, that really people will understand that Israel is not going to change in its views, um, that this is the safe place for the Jews from an international perspective, 
from a legal perspective that a strong Israel in the Middle East is really productive for everyone and that some way we find a way to have peace. But the, the way that we're going to find peace isn't going to come by putting Israel's current state at risk. So I hope something like that comes in the future. But currently, the way it's structured, there's a lot of what to be pessimistic about with the sentiment around the world. But I truly am truly am praying that one day there will be a true peace where Israel's people are not at risk. Uh, what's your website, Facebook page for people who'd like to know more about the work that you do? Our Facebook, our website, Imtirtsu, that is I am, because I know it could be a little hard to pronounce, I am space T-I-R-T-Z-U. We have a Facebook, we have a Twitter, we have an Instagram, we have a website. You can sign up for our newsletter to really keep it up to date with all our activities because we, it's really important to kind of get the insider perspective of what's really going on in Israel. Okay, Josh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. And really, this is, if anybody has any questions about Imtirtsu or they want to reach out, my email is josh, J-O-S-H, dot L at imti.org.io.